All right, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. This is April the 30th, 2017. And our guest today is John Paget and friend. Hey, John. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> How you doing? Who's this? Um, this is uh, my doll, Reggie McRascal. Who are you calling a doll? Can you do this? <laughs> what do you mean? Turn, turn my head all the way around like that? Yeah. Well, of course not. That's funny. What's so funny about that? I thought all dunnies could. Is that the silliest thing you're going to say today? No, that it's the funniest. That's right. If you haven't left now, that's the act. Well, good night. Oh. Oh, sorry. John, is it true that you are a ventriloquist? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it is. Sadly, it's true. Oh. All right. Let's do introductions, and then let's... Uh... Hit John with a barrage of questions. Uh, let's start on SP's side and work our way over. Okay, SP. Hi there. Uh, I'm SP Miskowski and I write fiction. Rick. Rick Lay, writer. Phil. Uh, Philip Fracassi. I'm a screenwriter and a horror author, and my current collection is Behold the Void. Uh, Mr. Reanimator. Uh, I'm Pete Rollick, uh, Lord of the Reanimated, apparently. Uh, by default, apparently. I guess. Joe. I'm Joe Polar, writer, editor, mayor of Carcosa. <laughs> and we got Derek here. Derek, introduce yourself for us. I'm Derek Hussey. I'm the publisher of Hippocampus Press. All right, and last but not least, uh, Aesop. Uh, Aesop Hill, I guess Dirtbag is about the best way to put it right now. <laughs> That's Mr. Dirtbag to you. Yeah, Mr. Dirtbag. Would that be, I don't know, where's uh, Where's your editor, chief commander-in-chief this week? Who, Kelly? Yeah. Oh, yeah, Strange Eon's editor-in-chief. Yeah. Well, apparently Kelly's girlfriend is in town, and apparently she's more important than we are. Oh, uh, he yeah. always has the best titles. I wish I had him to give me a title. He's got the best ones, so yeah. I'll have to defer to him. Oh, there's Matthew Carpenter just in time. Why don't you introduce yourself, Matt? I am Matt. Great. Hey, Matt. Short and sweet. <laughs> I'm Mike Davis. Um, so, John is a ventriloquist. He's the author of The Secret of Ventriloquism. And you're the founder of Thomas Ligotti Online. Yeah, yeah, I am. You want to talk about that first? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, it, it all kind of ties in uh, uh, to uh, the beginning of my, my uh, writing endeavors anyway. Um, uh, I came in contact. You, you know what? Let me interrupt you there. Um, didn't you want to? Did, did did Reggie have something else to say or sing? Oh, or did you want to do that later? <laughs> I, I was I, I, I was uh, thinking that I would. Uh... It, it is totally up to you. We're flexible, and also before I forget, our prize today is going to be another ticket to Necronomicon. So I'll tell you how to win that a little bit later on in the show, for those who are listening live and later this week. So all right. Yeah, I yeah. I, I I guess I'll go ahead and and uh, embarrass myself a little more, so. <laughs> hey, Hoberman, hey, Dapper Dan, you've both got your style, but brother, you're never fully dressed without a smile. <laughs> your clothes may be Bobramily, they stand out a mile, but brother, you're never fully dressed without a smile. Take it away, Reg. Who cares what they're wearing on Main Street or Savile Row? That's right, it's what you wear from ear to ear and not from head to toe. That matters. So, Senator, so, Janitor, so long for a while, remember you're never fully dressed, though you may wear the best. You're never fully dressed without 
Oh, smile, smile, smile. Smile, darn you, smile. Yeah. That's awesome. Then <laughs> that's the first for uh, this podcast. <laughs> Introducing John Paget, whose songs will go into your head and into your heart. And they won't do your stomach any good either. Oh, all right, that's enough. Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> Hang out. Equally entertaining and disturbing, the way I like it. <laughs> weird, weird fiction. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it's, uh, y you know, I, I got into ventriloquism to begin with because I was scared of dolls. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, when, I was, when I was four years old, uh, my parents let me s see uh, an old night gallery episode. Um, actually, it was a new night gallery episode at the time, um, The Doll. And uh, that gave me recurring nightmares and night terrors for about the next five years. Um, at which point, I, uh, uh, you know, I was just getting over my fear of this doll and dolls in general when I saw the, the night gallery, or not the night gallery, the, uh, the Twilight Zone episode, um, The Dummy with Cliff Robertson. And, uh, and that scared the hell out of me. And I knew that I had to figure out how it was done. So I asked my mom and dad for a ventriloquist dummy for my birthday. Um, and no, not my birthday, for, for Christmas. I was nine years old. And uh, they got me a $20 Mortimer Snurd doll, which was Char Charlie McCarthy's oh, yeah. uh, country bumpkin cousin. You know, the, the, the dummy that was the most uh, innocuous and, and non-threatening looking. Um, so that, uh, that dummy had um, a, a pamphlet in it called Seven Simple Steps to Ventriloquism. It was just a, a two-page pamphlet um, that went through the basics. And I picked it up, and uh, I was already acting uh, on stage and had been for the last two or three years. Um, so it, it just came naturally to me. I, and I started doing it more and more. Um, when I was about 12, uh, I, I started doing birthday shows. Um, uh, with, with a, a, an upgraded dummy. And then when I was 15, I got a loan from the bank uh, to get Reggie. And uh, so that's, that's, that's that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, you've had him a while. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're at least 30 now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, I'm a little more than that. Um, <laughs> I, I have a question based yeah. on what you just told us, John. Sure. You, sure. You, you for years had this deep-seated fear of dolls, and, yeah. and your parents gave you this doll. So here it is; it's in the house, and <laughs> you've just gotten it, but you're still afraid. It yeah. Was, so you had a room in your house, I would assume, and those first days when you owned the doll. Did the doll go up to your room with you? Did you <laughs> sleep in the room with you at night? How you know, how I, were you in those first few days when you were, let's say, alone with this doll? I I was I wasn't ever alone with the doll in the first few days. I uh, um, uh, I, I kept him in the living room downstairs. Uh, we we had an old house in the in in the suburbs. In Mobile, Alabama, and and um, um, yeah, I, uh, that's that that's an excellent question. I actually have a decent story about this because you know I, I slowly started um, I, I slowly started moving uh, Joe. His name was Joe Snurd. Um, uh, well, wait a minute, there was a dummy named Joe. I can't be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was there was the dummy's name was Joe. No comment. Um, so, Shut up, Davis. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, uh, um, later to become Joe Snavely. Um, but uh, at, at any rate, I, I started moving him closer and closer uh, to my bedroom at night. Uh, 
to try to get over my fear of dummies. So the first night that I, I set him in the room with me to go to sleep, uh, I had him in a little rocking chair. In fact, my, my kid has this same rocking chair now, um, a, a little wooden rocking chair um, across the room from me. And I made sure to move the chair so that the dummy wasn't looking at me. Well, I went to bed, you know, a little nervous, and I started hearing some movement in my room. And, and this, is, this is completely oh true. Um, we had old hardwood floors, and I started hearing kind of a wood-on-wood wood sound. So I looked up, and the dummy was facing me, um, looking straight at me. And, you know, of course, I was freaking out, but I was thinking, okay, I, I, I must have... Um, I must have forgotten. I must have uh, uh, um, not turned him away as I thought I did. So, uh, you know, I got under the covers, of course, and uh, started hearing more noises uh, of kind of a slow sliding noise across the, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the floor. And I'm completely freaking out. Uh, look, uh, you know, over my covers and see that he's closer to the bed. So this goes on for a while. And eventually, he is very close to me. And I passed out. Um, didn't remember anything, didn't have any weird dreams. Um, I, I remember waking up in the morning before I opened my eyes, though, and I felt something on top of me. Um, and, and a little plastic nose pressed against my nose. I open my oh, eyes and grab the dummy. Of course, it is the dummy looking right into my face, my worst nightmare. I throw him across the room, run out of the room screaming for my mom, and my older brother is downstairs laughing his ass off. Uh, it, it, it was the worst, the worst prank of my childhood. Um, and I did not sleep with him um, with the dummy in my room after that, uh, even though I knew it was a prank. You, you, you I think I now see where that um, that first story came from about the brother. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that that was that was definitely uh, that, that got me into some trouble with with uh, my, my family. Um, uh, but yeah, that was that was based on on a true story. I would I would say that probably forty percent of that uh, story is true. Um, that's a that's a wonderful story. Murmurs of a voice foreknown is that the one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's a great story. I um, uh, I have a cousin who has two little boys, and when their second baby was born, um, and he was about nine months old, uh, the boys were playing together, and the older boy was sort of roughhousing with the baby, uh. and they kept having to tell him to calm down, calm down, not be so rough with the baby. And uh, at one point, my cousin said, all we have to do is make sure the baby survives to the age of one. Huh. If you can make it to the age of one without his brother killing him, he'll uh. probably survive. <laughs> 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 and I kept yeah, thinking serious. about that when I was reading your story. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, we laugh about sibling rivalry and we talk about uh, its significance, but it's a very, it can be a very dark subject. And I think you explored it masterfully in that story. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you, you know, that story, uh, um, when, when I wrote it, uh, it was a story that I always wanted to write. Um, uh, probably, at least partially, to, to get revenge on my brother. <laughs> um, but uh, I... Um, uh, that story, I had the, the worst trouble in the last uh, page or two of writing that story. I had so many various endings, some of them supernatural in nature. And finally, um, that one came to me and, uh, and, felt, and felt right. Um, so probably of, of, of all of my stories so far, that may be the, the ending that I'm happiest with. Um, uh, I, I uh, you know, it's interesting too. Um, in, in talking about sibling rivalry, 
uh, I happened to be, well, early on after, uh, um, after the story came out, uh, actually in Pseudopod, uh, it, there, it, it, it was recorded um, uh, by a, a, a great narrator, of, of Paul Cram. Um, and uh, somehow I, I, I found this, this site on um, uh, people talking about sibling rivalry and abuse and, you know, for real. And um, uh, I, I think I, I was searching for the pseudopod URL and, um, and, and this came up and, and, and there were people actually discussing the story, um, which I thought was really cool and saying, you know, this, this guy really gets it. And then I, you know, I thought, yes, you know, uh, at, at least I, I, I did that much right. <laughs> I bet that was nice to see you too. Yeah. Uh, Rick had a question for you, I believe. Yes, you mentioned that it was the episode The Doll from Night Gallery. Yeah. Which the doll had teeth. Uh huh. Were, were you bothered about being bitten by dolls? I'm just oh, kidding. yeah. That, that, was, that was the thing, right? I mean, the, the doll um, it was based on an, an Algernon Blackwood story of the same name. And um, the doll was about the granddaughter of a, uh, a, a colonel in uh, British colonial times, not colonial times, sorry, uh, uh, imperial uh, times, uh, Victorian era, um, and, and was set in India, right? You remember it. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, at any rate, this, this colonel, uh, uh, he, he was in, in the war uh, against an uprising in India and uh which which killed the the leader of the insurrection there uh and the the leader's brother um uh at the beginning of this story pops up and uh basically says you know i'm going to take my revenge on you uh colonel uh just be looking for a package package comes it's this hideous doll um that the the colonel's uh, uh, granddaughter immediately takes to, uh, and the colonel he knows you know this is, this is some kind of magical fetish doll. It's going to take its revenge. Uh, the Indian guy, the the, the brother says, um, um, you know the doll has teeth, and there is no uh, uh, the poison will kill you by by sunrise and. Uh, no antidote in the world can save you. So, you know, the, the, the colonel does everything that he can to, to get rid of this doll. He even throws it into the fire at one point, but it, it mysteriously pops back up in the girl's room. Um, and, uh, of course, the doll starts talking to the girl as well. We don't see this, but the girl uh, lets her grandfather know the doll is talking to her and doesn't like the doll that uh, the grandfather gave her um, and ends up tearing it up one night. So uh, all of this to say at the end, he is coming up the stairs because his, his granddaughter is screaming because the doll has torn the, uh, the, the Italian doll apart. And, um, and there's the doll, you know, on, on the stairs looking at the colonel, uh, it bites him and he's dead by morning. Um, so that doll, that very same doll, um, is the exact doll that I had nightmares about every night. And, uh, and, and I remembered everything that happened in that episode, even though I was four years old, it made such a big impression on me. And that probably changed the, the course of my life, you know, um, and it, uh, it, 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 definitely, it definitely gave me a, a, a morbid bent, I think, very early on. Yeah, Philip, you have a question? Yeah, so I wanted to ask a question about the book, um, The Secret of Ventriloquism, which is, I have the hard copy right here which uh, was put up by Dunham's Manor Press. And um, 
So, John, my question right when I was reading, and I didn't actually know this going into it, uh, but I, as I was going through the book, I began to realize that the stories are interconnected. Uh, in the book, and I was wondering, was at what point did that become a conscious decision? Was it a conscious decision before you started assembling the stories, or was it a conscious decision where you kind of went and started, um, you know, like maybe midway through what you were, you know, at, when you pick and choose what you're gonna have for the collection, you're like, well, maybe I can make this all one kind of like Ghosters by Ralph Robert Moore does a similar thing where they're short stories, but they all have a, a similar thread and they're in the same universe. Yeah. Um, yeah, can you talk about that a little bit? Because I thought that was really fascinating. Oh, absolutely. That's a great uh, question. I, I um, uh, originally, um, I, I had no idea that I was going to write a collection of short stories that were interconnected that closely. Um, it, it was kind of an organic process. Um, the first story that I wrote was originally called The Secret of Ventriloquism, uh, later became 20 Simple Steps to Ventriloquism uh, and the one-act play, The Secret of Ventriloquism. Those two kind of split off uh, and, and told different stories, um, but related. Um, so um, after that, I wrote The Infusorium. Now, The Infusorium was always um, supposed to be kind of a sequel to uh, um, the original 20 Simple Steps to Ventriloquism. Um, I, I, I wanted to tell the story of, you know, what happened uh, to the city that, um, uh, that, that Joseph Snavely and Reggie McRaskill lived in. Um, and, you know, there, it, was, it was clear that, a, that uh, a, an incredible catastrophe had happened, the, the, the Flight 389. Um, that went down and, and that really haunted me and haunted the, the whole collection. Um, uh, so after that, after, after I wrote that, I, I started um, strengthening the connections between that original story um, and uh, the infusorium. Um, once I started writing more, I started uh, I, I, I started realizing, you know, I, I haven't really told this whole story as much as, as I want because e almost every story that I wrote started having common elements come up in it. And I started realizing, you know, this is, this is the same town. Um, and it, it really wasn't until fairly late in the game when I wrote um, Origami Dreams that I realized that um, not only is this, uh, are many of these stories, uh, if not all of them, uh, existing in Dunstown, um, but that there are common characters as well that, that keep popping up either explicitly or uh, subtly in the background. Um, after I got to the end of the process where, where I'd written all of the stories that were, were to appear in the collection, I went back through and, um, and strengthened those connections uh, as much as possible. It just, it felt like the right thing to do. It felt like I was, I was telling a, a hybrid novel story. Um, uh, and, and, and actually, he, what one thing that's incredible? Um, you, you mentioned Dunham's Manor Press and Jordan Crawl, the editor um, and publisher, also a fantastic writer uh, in in his own regard. Um, he allowed me very late to insert the final uh, story uh, into the collection, which I felt like really wrapped uh, wrapped things up um, as kind of much of a fever dream and experimental as it was in many ways. Um, uh, so so I, I, I feel really good about um, the, the fact that, that the, the stories are so uh, uh, tied in together. Absolutely was not uh, expecting to do that. Uh, very glad that it, it, it wound up that way. Um, 
And what's funny is too is the 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 first uh, collection that I read after um, a- after writing my collection was uh, Laird Barron's Swift to Chase, and I, w- I was kind of delighted to see that that uh, uh, al- although the two collections are very different. Um, uh, he also had, you know, the, the, the very solid narrative thread that kind of went through the whole thing and, and really made it, um, more than the sum of its parts or reverse that (laughs) made the sum of its parts greater than, than the, the, the parts themselves. Yeah, and it also it's fun as a reader, like the in, like your story, the indoor swamp, and then having that kind of tied in later uh, at a later story. I don't remember exactly which one it was, but and <clears throat> there's something neat about it as a reader because all of a sudden you feel like you're not reading a bus of, a bunch of disassociated ideas, uh, which is cool uh, on a one by one basis, but it's kind of exciting to kind of feel like oh, I'm kind of experiencing. A world and through different interactions with different characters and different and, and it, I, I think it's a great concept and I'm, I'm glad you did it because it it made the book work for me on a different level other than just like each story being unique and sort of creepy and well written which I enjoyed it was as a whole now it's much more special to me as a reader because I kind of feel like I was shown a universe uh, that I didn't that I wasn't aware that I was even being shown until really I think it was like the second last few stories so yeah that's 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 great to hear um uh you know another uh, after the after the fact uh, um uh another set of collections uh that i consumed pretty close afterwards were uh matthew and bartlett's work and and and, uh and i was happy to see that you know there there's a universe there and i absolutely am crazy about his stuff um, it's funny that you bring him up, John, because he's watching live and he wrote on my uh, Facebook group that he didn't realize that you founded TLO. Oh, <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, I, I, I did. And uh, that's that's an interesting that's an interesting story in and of itself. So, like, yeah, John, I, I, could you talk a little bit? I mean, I don't mean to interrupt, but oh, can no. you yeah, expound, uh, expand on uh, how Ligotti influenced your writing and and the role that he played in helping you to develop uh, these stories, oh, not yeah. helping you to develop them, but as a as a critic and as an editor and you know yeah, set ab- of eyes. Absolutely, um, uh, Ligotti was was key. You know, I before I read Ligotti, I never, I I I, I wrote and I wanted to write, but um, I never I I never thought that um, I could write something as intimate um, as, as what I was reading. When I first picked, picked up Songs of a Dead Dreamer, I remember it was, uh, I, I think, the summer of, of 1991. And I was in a Books A Million, and I, I, saw, I, I saw the, the, uh, uh, the title, which enticed me. There it is. <laughs> Jez got it. Um, and uh, um, and I flipped to the back, and you know I saw the Washington Post uh, blurb about you know put this between um, the work of Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft where it belongs, and that sold me. Um, and I, I actually I started reading the book in um, uh, in the store, and a friend of mine told me. Uh, reminded me some years ago that uh, it, it, he he was actually with me, and um, uh, I couldn't put down the book even when I was driving, uh, which you know scared the hell out of him. And I think eventually he told me to pull over so that he, so that he could drive because I literally couldn't put it down. I felt like I had had found my real life Necronomicon, you know? See, like, that's, oh, is, reading weird fiction is dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> literally in that case. And I remember uh, Poppy Z. Bright's introduction to that. Mm-hmm. Being yeah, like, yeah, that, that holy was, crap. Yeah, that was, that was actually yeah. the, night, the Nightmare uh, Network. Yeah, or, Nightmare uh, Factory. Nightmare Factory, sorry. You're right, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
but yeah, that yeah. was that was a very memorable one because that was yeah. right around the time that I started trying to track Ligotti down. Um, yeah, because Campbell 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 did the introduction to Saul. You're right for the first right. time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He. So John, you 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 bought the paperback, I assume. Oh the one yeah. I just showed. Yep. As I did. Yeah. Did, did, did was there one thing in particular? And I love the whole book, but. The frolic. Yeah, I, no, the I was I, the, the frolic hooked me. Um, it is it is not my it is not one of my favorite Ligotti stories, but it has one of the most remarkable uh, ending sequences. Um, you know, in weird fiction, it's it. it oh it's, yeah, I, I, it's, I, I, it's a huge influence on me. I I can't even put my finger on what it is that resonates in that story, but it just stays with you. It does. the The images are are, are uh, unforgettable. Um, you, you know, I, who, who I, I I never would have dreamed of a, a galaxy being compared to a sewer or you know a toilet. You know, um, before I read. Well, that's it. That that particular that particular paragraph is one of the finest things written. In, in all the weird fiction, it, it's the, the, it's the amazing. poetics are just off the chart, and you you read it, you finish the story a couple paragraphs later. I think I went back and reread that paragraph like <laughs> six or seven times before I could progress to the yeah. next story in the book. No, it's a it's it's a stunner, and I knew I I knew I was hooked um, very early on when I read that, but. Um, Ligotti, you know, I I knew from the time that I started reading Ligotti that if I ever was able to write fiction, that this is the kind of fiction that I would want to write. This is it, you know, and and uh, I never thought, you know, that I would write anything near the quality uh, uh, of it, but that didn't matter. I, I'd, I'd found my, my writer and uh, and and it stuck, and I became, you know, uh, Tom. Uh, once in the '90s, he he called me, you know, Jonathan the Baptist. I mean, I, I was uh, I, I was singing his praises uh, everywhere that I could, giving people copies of uh, of his work, and, uh, and and that started happening on the internet as well in the mid '90s. Um, I, I I first created a Usenet group, uh, Alt Books, Thomas Ligotti. And then I created Ligotti.net, uh, Thomas Ligotti Online. Um, and around that time, I guessed Ligotti's uh, email address because I realized where he was working. Um, and, uh, I, and I was hoping that, you know, uh, he wouldn't think that I was a, a dangerous stalker. Um, but he did not. I, 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 I wrote him that, that initial email and he wrote me back a very uh, kind and generous uh, email in return. Um, all of this to say, you know, probably a, a year or two before um, I got in contact with him, I uh, I wrote a story of my own. Um, it was the first draft of of what would later become the Secret of Ventriloquism, and this was back in 1994, um, and uh, and it was called The Eyes of the Master. It was very much a Poe slash Ligotti pastiche, and it was terrible. Um, I mean, it was just awful. And and of course, um, as as a complete uh, neophyte, um, I thought that it was uh, brilliant. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, and, and actually sent it to to Tom um, as 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 an ode and. Once I had already, uh, I had already been taken down a few pegs by my girlfriend, now wife, um, when she read it and 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 saw it for what it was, which was a terrible uh, 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 pastiche by somebody who didn't know how to write uh, creatively. She took um, you down a few pegs. Yeah, she she didn't say it in those terms, but uh, I got the message, and uh, after after Tom. Right. And then I really got the message once. Once Tom, he was very kind and generous about it, but 
I, I could read between the lines and and he obviously thought, you know, this was a, a kind, you know, Poe slash Legati pastiche. I really appreciate it. Um, so uh, after that, I, I um, you know, I decided, well, I, you know, okay, this isn't good. So I really want to write a good story. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not an author, but hey, I, I, I want to write. If I can write just one good story, then I'll, I'll be finished. Um, and, and, and I told Tom that. And at a certain point, uh, we were corresponding back and forth uh, daily. You know, we started talking on the phone. Um, and, uh, and at some point, as we were becoming friends, I said, you know what? Um, could you please take a look at this thing critically and, 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 and give me your feedback and just, you know, gloves off. Um, I can take it. And boy, did he ever take me down. Um, I, I mean, Tom is, is, uh, brilliant. Um, a, a very kind and generous man, funny as hell, but he's very serious about the craft. And, uh, and he let me know in those uncertain terms um, in the drafts that came that, you know, this isn't working and this is why this is not working. Um, and uh, you don't know how to write yet. Um, and, and I just kept on going back to the drawing board. You know, I would, I would come up with a version of the story that I'd be excited about and send it to him. And, you know, he would send it back to me covered in red. Um, and, and, you know, pointing out the, the, the sentences uh, here and there that might work or be interesting, but letting me know that this it isn't working and it isn't working. And so finally, this went on for years. Um, and finally, in about 2004, uh, it, it occurred to me, you know, Tom kept on saying, what you really need to focus on is what you know about um, that not a lot of other people know about. Um, and, and that's ventriloquism. So I started thinking about that and I started thinking about that original dummy that I had the, and the, the seven simple steps pamphlet. And I started thinking, well, what if there was, what if that seven simple steps guidebook was only part of what the writer originally intended to write? What if this guy had, you know, 14 steps or, or 18 steps or, or what have you, and they just keep getting crazier and crazier. Um, and, and, um, and the writer himself starts losing his mind. Um, and that's where I started with an outline. I sent it to Ligotti and he said, you know, this could, this, this could, this outline could be a great story. And it was the first time, you know, um, and after that, then the really hard work began because I still didn't know how to write a story. And uh, so I, I draft upon draft upon draft. And at the same time I was writing these drafts, I was reading drafts of Ligotti's The Conspiracy Against the Human Race, which those of you who've read it know is pretty intense. Um, and, yeah. and at the same time, this was, uh, this was 2004 when I, when this outline was created. Well, 2005 came then hurricane Katrina hit. Um, we were, we had to evacuate. We were gone for over a month from our homes. We didn't know if our home was still standing or not. Uh, we were very lucky that it was. Um, we came back and, and I was, the work I was doing at the time was very much disaster related. So I was, very in on that and all of the recovery. And I and uh, my, my wife and everyone that we knew who lived in town was in a state of, of shock to one degree or another. You know, it was a city of people with post-traumatic stress syndrome. And, uh, and, and that kind of fed the story as well. Um, and finally, you know, it wasn't until, I guess it wasn't until after 2010, 2011, that 
I, I had a finished version of the story that Tom said, this is really good. Um, uh, well done. Uh, you can take the, the walk of victory. The Ligotti, a uh, little trivia on Ligotti. He always, after he completely finishes a story, he takes a walk. And he calls it the walk of victory. He takes a walk around the block. And uh, uh, so that that's a that that's a a, a habit that yeah. I've picked up as well. That had to feel pretty good when he finally told you that. It did. It it, it felt great. And uh, and this coincided with it was around the time that um, um, I, I caught wind through Ligotti, I think, of uh, Joe's um, uh, Ligotti. Um, uh, anthology, uh, the Grimm's Crabs puppets. puppets. So, yeah. was it uh, the Infusorium that took another four years, if I remember right? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's the. It didn't. You know, I joke that you know the the uh, the original story took you know almost twenty years to write, and um, uh, the second story only took four years. Um, but yeah, and I, I, you know, I had really bitten off more than I could chew with that story. Um, the infusorium, I mean, there were so many narrative pieces, uh, to that, that I had to juggle and there were so many versions of that. And that's, I, it was, I, I think the infusorium was finally when, you know, because I was sending drafts to Ligotti for him to look at of that as well. And, uh, and then Ligotti started having uh, the big health issues. Um, and then of course, uh, the, the mental issues that he had, uh, has uh, became exacerbated. And, you know, at a certain point he got, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't really read much anymore. Um, he listens uh, uh, and he watches, but uh, reading just is very, very difficult for him now. Um, let alone looking at somebody's work critically. Uh, when you say listens, do you mean audiobooks? Yeah, yeah, audio audiobooks, um, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, audio related materials, um, interviews. Uh, he loves those as well. But uh, is this part of the reason that, and not to jump ahead, but is this part of the reason for the audio project that you're currently working on? Well, you know, that's that has that's always been. Um, uh, that's always been what I've considered my forte. Okay. Um, uh, I started acting when I was uh, six years old in community theater. Okay. And from the, then until my early 20s, uh, I was always involved in a play, almost always involved in a play, sometimes more than one at, at a time. Um, uh, I got my bachelor's degree in theater arts. So very soon after I started reading Ligotti and became aware of him, I started uh, creating tapes, audio tapes of his stories. Um, and, and, and then started reading other stories that I liked too. I, I wasn't producing these for anybody's amusement but my own or, or maybe a friend or two. I, I would, I would let, listen as well. Um, and this continued on. Uh, uh, eventually, I started sending these tapes to Ligotti himself, uh, who would listen to them on his way to work um, in Detroit, uh, and uh, who, you know, really uh, got a good bit from them, actually. Uh, I remember him saying that uh, his story, The Salal, uh, from Noctuary, uh, that he never liked that story until he heard me read it. And, you know, reading a story and hearing a story aloud, uh, it's just a different experience. Okay. Uh, um, I, I always prefer reading a, a story on the page uh, to hearing it, but hearing it does open up a new dimension um, yeah, that, that the story alone does not have uh, and can't have. Uh, uh, so... Yeah. So you're reading a bungalow house is masterful. Oh, thank you. That, that, yeah. that was a, that was a long time coming. And that is, that is the, 
that is my favorite uh, short story. Because um, when I think of that, and uh, not to interrupt, but your Conrad Aiken, mm-hmm. the one that you did those two, like that, the Conrad Aiken. The, I mean, I realize it's off the Thomas Ligotti, but that reading of the Conrad Aiken. I mean, he was such a good uh, writer himself. But the way that you read that. <laughs> is it, it that that is amazing like we'll, we'll have to put the link up for that because that one is really good thank you thank i you. didn't mean to interrupt you there. oh no no not, to not, not, you on that not one. at all not at all i you know um I, i'm very proud of the, the the work that i did there you know i uh, when, when it comes to my writing and um uh I know, even though, you know, even though I worked on that same story for, for, you know, the better part of two decades, um, it wasn't a continuous working on it. I, I can't say that I was working day in and day out to the exclusion of everything. I mean, I was living, uh, I was working, uh, I was doing lots of different things and, 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 uh, I, I didn't have, um, I, I didn't have any kind of, of writerly work regimen as I should. Uh, so I still consider myself to be, even though I'm by no means young, I, I consider myself to be a young writer. I've got a lot to learn. Um, and and, and uh, I'm, I'm working uh, on, on being better. Um, it, all that to say, as, as a side note, um, when it comes to uh, uh, reading, I feel I, I I feel much more uh, professional as as a narrator than I do um, and a voiceover artist than I do uh, as a writer. Um, uh, not to take away from from the wonderful things that people have said and continue to say uh, 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 about my book, but uh, you know I can I can see. Any time I read my own work, I can see the holes. I can see the flaws, um, uh, which is why the editorial process is so endless. I mean, I'm sure that I could go back through my book and and do another pass of uh, very um, aggressive edits, uh, uh, and deletions, and, uh, and additions. When it comes to my narration, I by no means am saying that I, I feel like I'm, uh, I, you know, incredible, but I feel much more confident. Um, and, and I've just had a lot of training and a lot of experience, both on the stage and off. And um, um, and, and especially with, with that story, The Bungalow House, you know, I, I went through so many drafts. And that, that actually is the one story that um that i sent back and forth at the time to Legati. it was it was it was pre-katrina it was just pre-katrina that i did it um and uh the most important note that he gave me i, I remember i sent him a version and he said you know the 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 um uh the bungalow tape guy bungalow bill <laughs> he sounds like uh richard nixon um, after a three day bender <laughs> and, and, you know, he said, you know, just don't, don't worry about trying to, to, uh, perform this. This is, this is one guy telling the story. So, and, and this one guy is not, you know, some incredible actor. Um, uh, he is one person. I mean, that's the, the whole point of the, uh, of the story. And I took that to heart. Um, and, and, and it turned out really, really well. Um, Let me say something about this book, John, and then Joe has a question, The Secret of Ventriloquism. Uh, I don't really say this a lot. I do recommend a lot of books on this show. It's the th- one thing I get in emails from people more than any other comment is that they love the books that we recommend. But I cannot recommend The Secret of Ventriloquism highly enough. Oh, wow. If, okay. if you like weird fiction and you probably do if you're listening to this show. This is as weird as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that in a good way. I mean, you really need to pick this book up. It, 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 it's available in print, of course. Uh, here's my copy. Um, 
and it's also available if you have Kindle Unlimited. It's free to read on Kindle Unlimited. So, um, you know, pick it up. I I love it. Thank and, you so much. That that means that means a lot. Because I I mean I highly respect you and your your uh, <laughs> an authority. Um, so yeah, I'm humbled. It's a terrific wow. collection. It's 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 really beautiful writing. Um, and I think what I love. Uh, first of all, is the starkness of it. Um, you know, there's there's a real dream or nightmare quality to the stories, but they're not dreamy. You know, they're not, um, they're very disturbing, um, but, they, but they go to the heart of um, human experience, if you will. Uh, they go to the heart of what it means to be alive and, and, you know, to the heart of consciousness and, you know, what we are. Um, and so it's, it's a really fascinating book and uh, beautifully written and beautifully sustained. Uh, so I, I highly recommend it too. My, my vote doesn't count as much as Mike Davis's, but uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great book and uh, everyone should pick up a copy. And especially if you're trying to write weird fiction or strange stories, you should read this book. It's, uh, it's, it's just beautifully written. Thank you. Or put, or put another way, when I'm reading a book and I'm like, and I'm think, so I'm saying to myself, where the hell does he get this shit? That's a good book. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's a good book. Yeah, yes. you have a question, Joe. Yeah, I, I, I have some comments and a question. I, and, sure. and, and let me preface this by saying I'm, I'm extremely biased when it comes to John's work. Um, in, in regards to the collection itself, I, probably the highest praise I can pay pay the book is after reading each story, I couldn't just go to the next story. Hmm. It the quality, the craftsmanship of the work, the content, the visionary qualities. It's like I had to in, stay with that story, enjoy it, digest it before I could move along. Um, it's an amazing collection. But again, look, I have a bias here. Um, John had mentioned Tom and the Grim Scribes Puppet, which was a, a tribute anthology I did to Ligotti's work, because um, I've been a fan as long as John has. Um, and Tom had mentioned to me that he knew someone um, who had written something that uh, he quite enjoyed. And he knew who I was inviting basically to the Grim Scribes puppets. He knew if everything played the way I thought it would, the book was basically full, but would I take a look at something? That something turned out to be John's um, uh, 20 Steps to Ventriloquism. I told Tom, I'll read it, but I'm not making any promises. Um, John sent me the work. Um, and I fell in love with the story, um, but it was also late in the game as I was putting the book together and John's, the version he sent me was, it was, it was 15,000 words yeah. if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I started playing with my word counts and I went to the publisher and it's like, you can bump this up this far and no farther. And then I went back to my calculations and it's like, shit. Um, so uh, the version that's in Grim Scribes, which I adore, is, is a shorter version. Yeah. And yeah. I, I have always felt deeply guilty <laughs> for, for saying, I, I like this, but I too long no no um, not, not, at, not at all joe i mean um, it the you doing that helped helped me so 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 much because um and, and i i know that you've stated in the past that you, you prefer the long version of the story and the I, long I don't version, i don't prefer it the long version well the the long it's 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 interesting because in the collection itself uh i you know 
I don't know how successful I, I was doing this, but I was able to tell the full story um, <laughs> through uh, 20 Simple Steps to Ventriloquism and um, the play, the one act play, secret, The Secret of Ventriloquism. But right. the process of stripping 10,000 words from that story um, was uh, a, an eye opener. You know, I, I, I realized that, that I could not only strip away some of the characters, but I could strip away all of the characters. <laughs> and and, and I, I could strip away not only some of the plot, but all of the plot and still have a, a, a story that was distilled down to its essential elements. Right, um, and, and I, I think you did a fantastic job in the end, I, I absolutely loved what you did, and of course, I used it. Um, but I've always felt guilty. I've always felt like I've deprived readers of a gem. Um, oh, thank in, you. In, in ways, the final version is the better version. Probably yeah. as an editor... As an editor, I have to go with the short version being superior. But as a reader who came to the work cold, and even though Ligotti suggested it, all he said is he'd read it and enjoyed it, and would I look at it? So I didn't have yeah, it was very a nice. lot of preconceptions going in. Um, plus, I didn't know what it was going in, and it's sort of like a first date. You know, I read the 15,000 word version. I knew I wanted it and immediately started panicking because it was too long. Yeah. And, and like and I, I said, go ahead. I had never been published before um, that. So it was, it was a huge, it was a huge leap of faith. And I mean, if you look at the table of contents of, of that anthology, I mean, uh, it, 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 con it, it contains, some of the the very best uh, yeah, I'm writers. Very, on I'm very proud, and it's an amazing. I was absolutely anthology. stunned that we won the Shirley Jackson Award for best anthology for that. Um, well, and, and you're you're just as big a part as everybody else in that collection. Um, but basically, my collection, my my not collection. My question is, um, do you think you might ever? somewhere in some form publish the original version well um the the original version uh or very close to the original version actually exists um uh, uh mike took it for uh, a, a lovecraft easing issue yeah oh, okay. i'm looking at it right now actually the yeah. secret of the Ventriloquism by john yep. paget yep that's the that that's pretty much that's pretty much oh, okay. it. I that's, mean, I did. That's I did free to that. read online. Just so the audience knows, that's free to read online at the Lovecraft Easy and website. Just, just I, I know, John Paget and the Mike Secret of Ventriloquism. I know Mike had published it, but I didn't real because I had read two different versions. I didn't read that. I just assumed it was the shorter version without looking at it. I'm no, sorry. No, um, no, not, not at all. It's, it's no. like I have for I have for years felt this great guilt like I deprived <laughs> readers. Yeah, well, go ahead and feel guilty. That's fine. <laughs> oh, thanks. It's, it's, <laughs> sort of like, it's sort of like Ted Klein. You have the events of Poor Ass Farm and you have the ceremonies. It's like, yeah, events of Poor Ass Farms is probably the superior piece of work. But I, I read the ceremonies first and I love the ceremonies. So, yeah, I do too. Um, uh, and, and and the longer version of my story is my sentimental favorite as as well. I mean, it, oh, it, oh, mine too. Like I it said, always, it was the first. Always will be. I mean, it's it's messy and sprawling. <laughs> it's got it's it's probably got too many uh, moving parts. But uh, I I you know it's it's the one that it's my first good. Story. You know, and, and as it, like I said, as an editor, it's what I read first, and it's a first date. I got done. I finished. I, I walked home from the date looking forward to the second date. You know, it's like, wow, that was really great. <laughs> you know? 
um, yeah. you know, it's funny because uh, um, when 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 Mike took uh, that story at the same time, Pseudopod took um, the shorter version, Twenty Simple Steps to Ventriloquism, and Pseudopod um, is a, a wonderful operation. Uh, uh, you know, and, and I was so lucky that. Basically, I, I I got published by my two favorites, Lovecraft Zine and, and Pseudopod, um, uh, one in print and and one that very kindly um, uh, Sean Garrett, uh, the co-editor of Pseudopod, allowed me to narrate myself, um, and uh, that story and that version of that story is still. Uh, available uh, for free online. Um, uh, uh, you know, about a year after that appeared, uh, I got contacted by uh, Stephen Susco, the the guy who wrote The Grudge, um, and uh, a, a movie producer now and director. Um, and uh, he optioned Twenty Simple Steps to Ventriloquism, um, uh, and. Uh, renewed the option this year as well and it's gotten it's gotten a, a, a lot of of interest uh Great. the screenplay is almost finished so you know fingers crossed <laughs> um we'll Absolutely. see That's Wonderful. Great news. john you and anybody else please jump in with questions as well but i'm curious about uh, i'd like for you to elaborate on something you wrote somewhere and i'm reading i'm quoting now you know what, I'm interested in the idea of redemption slash epiphany through horror. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on yeah, that? that yeah. I, that's interesting. That's, that, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, I went, uh, me and, and my wife uh, and our pets at the time went through Katrina. And post-Katrina, New Orleans was very difficult. It was a very difficult uh, city to live in for about five or six years. The infrastructure was shattered, uh, and it took a long time for it to become normal by uh, uh, previously thought of means. Um, and uh, we were all under a lot of stress. And and uh, and at the time, I uh, I really struggled with uh, anxiety um, and, and uh, you know my my friend and uh, um, fellow uh, TLO or uh, Matt Carden uh, who is also just a brilliant writer um, of fiction and nonfiction alike he uh, he suggested two things to me he suggested uh, a meditation process uh, uh, mindfulness uh, meditation um, and uh, he suggested the work of uh, Eckhart Tolle the, um, the the spiritual teacher who wrote the power of now um, and uh, uh, that had a big impact on me um, uh, that that book uh, and uh, daily meditation um, and uh, it had a big impact on on uh, my book as well, and the stories in it uh, were were very much affected by that. And I started, uh, what I started realizing is that I wanted to to I wanted to try to write uh, something that uh, that kind of got to the core idea that our minds are. Uh, um, they they drive us they drive us mad. <laughs> Our thoughts um, um, compulsively uh, uh, fill our, our 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 days and nights with uh, um, depression, anxiety, um, uh, and we very rarely really um, are here in the present now. Um, so where, where horror comes in is, uh, the idea that, uh, of, you know, the, the great 
horrific epiphany uh, in any number of, of horror stories becoming the catalyst for um, mental oblivion. And there are two sides of that oblivion. Yes, it's horrific. Identity gets swept away completely. You know, the idea of the black static uh, in one's head uh, that, that supersedes all uh, compulsive thoughts. But there's a positive side in there as well. Um, uh, when, when, you, when you are able to quiet your mind through whatever process, wh whether it's uh, a mindfulness practice or uh, medication, or in my case, a combination of both, <laughs> um, uh, your quality of life is better. Um, it, that's just a fact. It, 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 mm -hmm. and, and I struggle at times of great stress like many of us with compulsive thinking. So that's kind of what I was thinking about with many of these stories. Uh, the protagonists are struggling with, um, uh, they're haunted by the past. Um, they are anxious about the future. Uh, and the, the horrific events uh, that occur to them um, have the paradoxical effect of sweeping all that away. It is a kind of salvation by horror. We, we've talked in the past about horror as, as, as kind of a gnosis of, of knowing something that nobody else does know. I mean, we've used Dracula as an example. I mean, if you go up against Dracula and you're throwing holy water and um, you invoking Christ and tossing the crucifix around and it works. Well, you know shit. You don't, you just don't think, you know, anymore. You don't have faith. You've lost faith. Right. You know, and that's a huge revelation and it can be both enlightening and destructive at the same time. Yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, it's all, it's all a matter of perspective and you know, our, our minds uh, and our egos tell us that knowing is all about uh, facts and figures, memories, um, uh, compulsive, conceptions and imaginings of, of the future, but is that really the case? Um, uh, and that's, that's one of the major questions that I, I, I tried to, to um, not answer, but, but at least um, wrestle with in uh, The Secret of Ventriloquism. Well, in a lot of left-hand path traditions, like in uh, Indian traditions, and I mean East Indian traditions, the fear is a form of gnosis, and it's practiced that way. Like with the Agorai, they have specific practices to induce that all-encompassing fear of terror. I know that Lagati writes about that, even within a Conspiracy Against the Human Race. You know, and you talked earlier, not to interrupt, but about Matt Cardin, because I remember Matt Cardin was one of the very first in All Cthulhu that kind of was like hell yeah, let's join with TLO. And, you know, it, uh, I was, I think, I, I didn't know I asked you this earlier, but can you talk a little bit more about you guys' friendship on that? Because oh, yeah. I was really excited when I opened your book and saw that he had done the introduction, because I think he's one of the unsung heroes in this. He scene, is. Whatever you would call it, both he his is. fiction and his nonfiction. I'm almost excited by both of them equally. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, uh, and, and I'm proud to say that I am uh, Matt's first publisher. I, I published um, uh, an early oh. version of his story, Teeth, on, on uh, TLO back in 98, I think. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's an interesting uh, a story in and of itself. It's, a, it, it, it's literally a great story, but um, uh, he, uh, you know, I asked him at the time, and, and, and just to preface this, um, 
when I was first talking about creating a Legati Usenet site, he was practically the only person on Alt Horror Cthulhu uh, on the Usenet that thought that it was a good idea. Um, everybody else said, you know, to one degree or another, yeah, Legati's great, but I mean, who's going to, how many people are going to be interested in this kind of, you know, obscure writer um, who is by no means, you know, big on the scene, uh, that, that's too limited. It's too limited in scope. And, and Almost Matt, 20 years later, TLO is still going strong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> I was in the military at the time. I was on a submarine, so we would be out from once at a time and come back in, and you would download all your messages. And yeah, then yeah, we yeah. would get all the Usenet stuff at once. So I remember uh -huh. reading all this stuff and being like, are you guys insane? <laughs> yeah, because yeah. yeah, so. I did have uh, the first Carolyn Graff of Songs of a Dead Dreamer. Mm -hmm. Because at the time, there was like Clyde Barker, like I said, Poppy Z. Bright. You know, there wasn't that many people writing that type of thing. So I remember there was one other guy on the base that we would swap books back and forth. Cool. So I have a very clear memory of him going, have you read Legati yet? Yeah. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, who are you talking about? Yeah, you know? yeah. So I don't have that one anymore, but I still have my original copy of Grimscribe from the Carol and Graf. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, well, and, uh, he, I, 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 for, I forget what Tom said about the cover of that. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was something pretty funny. Um, uh, but yeah, back to back to Matt. Yeah. Um, um, I remember at the time, shortly after I had created the website, uh, we were for a long time. It was just me and him talking on alt books. Thomas Ligotti, you know. Uh, occasionally, somebody would pop up and write a message, but it was mostly us just corresponding back and forth. And I realized that 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 Cardin can he can in the course of 15 minutes, write just a random post that is brilliant and completely publishable, you know. Uh, uh, the, the guy's got a mind like a steel trap. Um, and, and I asked him, you know, have you ever tried to, to write stories before? And he said, yeah, you know, there's this one story called Teeth that I wrote about five or six years ago, but I've just put it up and I was like, well, let me see it. And, uh, and you know it was it it was in basically the form that it is now, but there was an added element, you know, of um, of kind of the the Lovecraftian writer rookie move of adding you know the Necronomicon and Yog Sothoth and uh, name dropping here and, and, and there, which totally can work in in certain fiction, but in his story. I was much more interested in everything else that he was doing. Uh, and, and I remember telling him at the time, you know, try stripping all of this stuff out and, 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 and see how it works uh, w without it. And uh, it worked very, very well indeed. Um, and uh, that it, it got a lot of attention um, being up on the Ligotti site. Uh, and, and from there, you know, he's, he's been, writing mostly in the darkness um uh, but uh, i i just i have immense respect uh for for matt um he's he's a remarkable mind and a, and a remarkable writer yeah it was just amazing when like i said when i opened the copy of your book and i saw that introduction uh the only thing i can liken it to is when i opened dp watts and I saw Timothy Jarvis had done the introduction. Similar experience where I'm like, okay, take it, you know, take notice of this. This is actually serious work that follows. Yeah. Because Matt Carden, I just held him in that esteem. Like anything he publishes, like even what's the name of his website? Teeming Brain. Yeah, yeah, Teeming like, Brain. He doesn't update that enough. Like when yeah. I do see that's updated, that's one of those things in your RSS feed. You're like, I'm going to save this for later in the day. Yeah, Matt's, so Matt's can one, he can he has the ability to log off for 
months and months at a time. Sometimes as much as a year or two will pass by and you'll be offline, um, which I, I kind of envy. <laughs> um, yeah, me too. In a, in a way, you know, it, it can be so burdensome. Um, but he's very, very um, good about uh, setting boundaries for himself. And that's yeah. one of the reasons why he hasn't um, he he hasn't produced as much as as you would think that he would have. Especially in the early two thousands, he was producing so much. But he he really respects when his mind goes into kind of a quiescent state right. um, uh, creatively, and he can remain in that state for a long time. I mean, he doesn't. He's he's one of the more ego free people that I know. Um, well, that leads me exactly into what I really been wanting to ask you because I know that your wife, your your longtime partner, is a poet. Yeah, in English professor because we talked about. It. And I wanted to ask you, how do you deal with two highly creative people because you've been involved with theater most of your life, oh, living yeah. in the same house together? That's a great the entire question. time, <laughs> especially through something traumatic like <laughs> Katrina and. All that's, the a, that, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. And, you know, the answer is um, a lot of my, the early years of my writing were completely in stealth mode. I mean, she would know, you know, I'm working on this, this story. I really want to get this one story right. But I didn't really talk about it much at all. Um, and, uh <sighs> Once it became, it started dawning on her in uh, the early teens that this was a real thing and that I was really writing now and I was going to continue writing. And y there, there was a time period where she was like, wow, you know, I did not sign up for being married to another writer. <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that is really, really just... I mean, I thought that you were an actor. What's going on here? Um, and uh, fortunately, she she had a sense of humor about that from the beginning. But it's it's been it's been a, a, a challenge at times. You know, she is she's an amazing poet. Uh, her her name is Carolyn Hembury, uh, an amazing poet and and, and a stellar uh, uh, professor as well. In fact, she just uh, received. Uh, an art grant at Atlas through the state, which is going to allow her uh, to be paid um, next year um, at the the University of New Orleans and be able to take the whole year off uh, to write. Um, it'll be her first sabbatical in 16 years, so it's it, it's great. But she, um, uh, more than anybody else, I would say, with the exception of Tom himself. Um, and as far as the book, the whole book is concerned, she did more to help me than anybody. Um, she spent a solid month of, of her summer off last summer um, reading and writing extensive notes on, um, on my book and all of the pieces in there. It was an amazing um, gift. Um, it was also, she, she is uh, no nonsense about uh, the craft of writing like Ligotti. So it was also a, a, a big ego blow at, at times, but I'm one that I really believe that it's, it's a good thing to uh, occasionally be knocked down some pegs. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it it's, it's a, you know, I, I, I can't forget that, you know, I'm, I, I'm young in this process. Uh, I, I, I am, I've, I, I've got a lot to learn and I'm, and I'm teaching, uh, myself, um, as much as I can, uh, through the, the work of others and through my beta readers, um, uh, and, and, uh, through, you know, uh, the, the, the people that I, I know and, uh, respect who are writers, um, uh, many of them are right here, right now, actually. Well, before we move on, uh, does anyone have any last questions for John? Anybody that we missed? 
I got kind of a personal question. You live in New Orleans sure. now, right, John? Yeah. Are you from like around Alabama originally, or what? Yeah, yeah. No, I, that, okay, I was having a hard time placing the accent. I wasn't quite. Yeah, I, I, where I, grew, was from. I grew up in Mobile, Alabama, um, and there's no question that uh, the Deep South um, has infected my work. I mean, it's uh, Dunstown is is uh, Mobile, Alabama, to many uh, in many ways. Um, certainly, uh, the all of the um, uh, uh, ranch style houses that appear uh, compulsively in, in my, my fiction um, uh, are uh, based on, on reality, um, as is the park, um, uh, that, whole, that whole area. It is a mill town as well. Uh, I actually did, though, a lot of, of research um, uh, uh, about environmental disaster uh, and real life environmental horror um, of the kind that you see in some of the, the stories in my book. Um, uh, it, so, yeah, yeah, uh, to answer your question, definitely. What year did you first move to New Orleans? Um, we moved to New Orleans in uh, 2001. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Did you know Harry Anderson at all, or no, no, um, no? <laughs> I was just curious. Um, before that, we lived in Tucson, Arizona, for a couple of years while uh, okay. Carolyn went to, to graduate school. Um, and before that, um, we were in New York City. Oh, okay, cool. So we've yeah, done... did, Derek, you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say it was great to hear you guys talking about old horror Cthulhu because I was a regular um, news net on that site back in the early to mid 90s when I was working at Routledge, an academic publisher. I probably should have been working on their projects, but I was on news net a lot of the time. Uh, in fact, that was how I got connected with St. Joshi and David E. Schultz, uh, just uh, through communicating with those guys on there. And I, I did not know that you were behind the. Uh, Thomas Legati, Usenet, or even, I mean, I think, I guess I knew you were by TLO, but fascinating stuff. Is, yeah. is that, is that, is Usenet still a going concern at all? Is, is it, it, it is. there, but it's pretty much dead. Yeah. As far as the alt horror Cthulhu, that ended really as an important venue about 2008 or 9 when Facebook really started to kick in. There's a big migration. Because I was active on that website from like, I'd say 2004, 2003 for like five, six years. And now you can go back and it's like there's not much there but spam. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. the name of the collection is The Secret of Ventriloquism by John Paget. It's available in print and for Kindle. It's on Kindle Unlimited if you're, if you've, if you're a part of that program. And I really recommend it. It's an audio um, audio book as well, right, John? Oh yeah, yeah. That's, that's that, right. That's, that's what I forgot to ask. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, the audio book I actually recorded myself. Um, at, that's at Audible. Yeah, I take it. It is. It, it you can okay. get it at Audible. You can get it at iTunes. Um, there may be one other venue that I'm not that that I'm not remembering, but uh, you know, I'm I, I'm I'm fairly pleased with with how. Uh, that came out um, and uh, was glad that, that uh, I was able to do it. It tickles me that you recorded that at the death metal capital of America. <laughs> Tampa, Florida. All right. So the secret of ventriloquism, John is a great talking with you. you can feel yeah. free to hang out with us for the next few minutes. If you want, we got a couple of other things to talk about. Sure, yeah. Um, we, next up, I hear we have a uh, StokerCon report. Is that right? You want to hear my my live report? Of sure, why not? I don't have much to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, StokerCon was cool. I mean, StokerCon, unlike Necronomicon, I'm sure I'm not a con guy. This is the first time I've gone to a con. Um, uh, it was very inclusive unto itself. Um, it was sort of the equivalent of going to a high school reunion uh, for a high school that you didn't go to. Um, 
in some senses. So if you didn't know a lot of the people or if you hadn't been ingrained into the kind of the HWA for the last decade or two decades or however many decades they've all been there, you definitely feel that, you know, you kind of got to make your own, make your own con experience special, which is what I tried to do. I just tried to meet a couple people that I wanted to meet. Um, but for the most part, they kind of kept it themselves. So it was interesting in that, interesting in that regard. But uh, it was very, you know, very well organized. Kate Jones. Uh, have what? you been to Necronomicon? No, okay. I haven't been to anything. This is the first time I've ever gone to it. I, I was just wondering because what I found at Necronomicon is it's very open and everyone's very accessible and friendly. Sort of different sounding vibe. Well, HWA is its own. Well, HWA is its own thing, right? It's a com it's a community yeah. that you that you that you can join uh, and you can become a member of, like I am. But uh, but the, the you know but there's a different level of membership. There's I you know there's the old school members who have all been together and all know each other and it's uh, and they all talk you know and they kind of keep to themselves and um, and it was a little disappointing because there was a lot of people I tried to engage with editors and and whatnot and um, you know I'm nobody so they weren't that interested in talking to me but I do think that I, um, so. I did get, I did get to talk to a few people who I thought were very cool. Um, and, uh, and I did meet a few people that I thought were very nice. And overall, it was a good experience. I got to meet George Martin, so that was cool. I got to hang out with Jonathan Mayberry. That was very cool. Um, so overall, a great, a great experience for me. Um, I would prefer – I'm looking for the Necronomicon. I'm looking forward to just being able to go talk to whoever I want and, um, and not have it be necessarily um, trying to break into circles. Uh, but, um, but this is the nature of what it is. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's ultimately it's an award show. With a bunch of panels. All right. It. First, first off, yeah. is you're not nobody. Okay. So, forget that part. And second off, it doesn't matter who you are. Mike, Pete, Rick, I. We we've, we've said this over the years. I don't know how many times. Whether you're a creator, or whether you're simply a fan or a reader whether you're a sculptor or a painter or a writer, we're, we're all in this community, this larger community, because we started out as readers, as fans. And to gather together, I like meeting new people. When, when I met John, okay, I, ne I never heard of him. I had heard TLO. I never... You know, it's the first work. You don't know who you're going to come across. You should, everybody should be treated the same. We, it, it's, it, it's a common interest. It's a common goal to enjoy this community. Um, but so when do we get to break out the champagne about the fishermen? <laughs> the that's fishermen. the great news. Yeah, Tom, yeah, man, John, yeah. yeah that's the best news. That's what I've been ever since I started about the, the Stokers. He won best novel. He did. Oh, I didn't know that. I don't really. Yeah, pay attention. he won that's best good. novel. I'm glad. Yeah, that's, that's the one that's been killing me. All right. Can, well, have you read that yet? John Lang. Yeah, no, Tim Wagner. Tim Wagner won the Stoker, uh, and he was yeah. a very nice guy. I met. I got to hang out with him a little bit, uh, and um, and Tom Deedy uh, Haven, the Cemetery Dance novel that won best first novel. I yeah. Think. Was Joyce Carol Oates actually there? No. Uh, no. No, she won two awards. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's one of those things where, um, I think it's one of those things where they do, I mean, I don't necessarily, I think it's just something that they do uh, with, and, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It was, it was interesting. It was interesting. I'm glad I went. I did have a nice time. They did a great job organizing it. Um, and I'm and I'm and I'm happy for for them. I hope they all. Well, have all that said, at, at Necronomicon, you will have to stand in line to talk to Pete Rollick. I don't know if anyone's told. Is that you the yet. bathroom line, or is that the? No, no, no. That's that is my. I mean, Pete and I will be waiting in line together, <laughs> chatting. <laughs> The All right, so I think next we've got a hip, hip, what's what's going on with Hippocampus the next month or so here, Derek? Well, how long do you have? I just got a list from David Schultz. We have about sixty books in the pipeline. 
So, uh, well, we don't have that long. <laughs> you're trying to bankrupt me. <laughs> well, and they'll all what, be what, let, let's see what's a couple highlights over right, what's coming well, out like the next couple of weeks then. Well, I have to mention Mark, Matt Carden because you guys were all heaping praise on him. It looks like sure. his uh, omnibus collection to Rouse Leviathan is finally coming back up to uh, active status. I just heard from him a couple of days ago, and he's finishing up a major rewrite on the big story, the big original story that was supposed to be in there. Uh, he had uh, This is one that he had originally co-written with Mark McLaughlin, and he's... Uh, heavily revised it. He changed it from third person to second person, and I think he's changed it back to third person now, uh, which is something he can do. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, so that should be pretty exciting. Looking forward to that. And uh, John Langan's uh, story collection? We, well, yeah, we have, we've announced Safira and other betrayals. That's going to be coming out soon as soon as he finishes writing the two original pieces that are supposed to be in there he's putting the finishing touches on the novelette and the novella One of which, sorry what's that title again derek safira s-e-f-i-r-a which is the that is the title of the novella the anchor novella that he is uh, writing for that and the subtitle is and other betrayals because i guess like we were talking about there, there's a thread that runs through all of these stories that was evident in retrospect that they're all about betrayals and uh, that should be great. I'm very pleased that he won the Stoker now because we can put Stoker award-winning author John Langan. Yeah, um, absolutely. We, you've also got a, a, a letter collection coming out this summer that we're all eager for, which is the Clark Ashton Smith one. Yes, I do. In fact, I'm working on that right now. This is the arc. I'm making my way through it. Uh, Dawnward Spire, Lonely Hill, the letters of Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith. And I didn't even know that. Yep, it uh, has both sides of the correspondence. It has a lot of interesting appendixes in there. We have, not a lot of people know that Clark Ashton Smith designed crossword puzzles. And he made them extremely complicated with very arcane words, as you can imagine. And we have managed to dredge up a fair amount of Clark Ashton Smith's crossword puzzles. So they will be included and you can work them yourself if, if you can. Uh, but the letters between Lovecraft and Smith are just really fascinating. And this will be coming out for Necronomicon, which means I have to get it to the printer in June because it's going to be a hardcover, one big hardcover by. You, you also have a C.L. Moore, Henry Cutner letter collection. Hell yes, that's coming out in paperback. It's uh, Moore, Cutner, Liber. Uh, I think we're going to put in the uh, letters to Pabdi, which is a set of letters that they just acquired up at uh, Brown University. We're kind enough to give us copies of it, so we're going to get those annotated and in there too. So how, how can people look at your catalog and buy Hippocampus books? Well, it's the website is hippocampuspress.com. Okay. And uh, I put up most of the new stuff is available for pre-order now. Uh, we are just now putting the finishing touches on S.T. Joshi's nonfiction book called Varieties of the Weird Tale, which uh, includes a lot of stuff about the classics. Uh, we have in there an uh, article about Bram Stoker, article about uh, William Hope Hodgson, some of the lesser known gothics like E. Nesbitt and uh, Wilkins Freeman, Mary Wilkins Freeman. Uh, and we have a book of uncollected stuff from Lord Dunsany. This is another of the titans that preceded Lovecraft. Uh, that's edited by S.T. Joshi and Martin Anderson called The Ghost in the Corner. And both of those should be available probably in two weeks. I've been saying that for a while, but this time we mean it. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Thanks. Hippocampuspress.com. Uh, uh, real quick, can I ask Derek yes. something real quick? Is there any... Uh, Works in the in the pipeline from Ann Schrader, and Kay Schrader. We don't have anything in the pipeline from her right okay. now. I mean, she's a regular contributor to our poetry journal, Spectral Realms. Right. And I would imagine that she is accumulating enough for another poetry collection. I just uh, hit my fingers crossed for a hail mary on that one. <laughs> what other letters do you have coming up after Clark Ashton Smith? Okay, well, I have a list right here. We have the letters to Maurice W. Moe. Uh, we have the letters to Lovecraft's family. 
that'll probably be a two volume set and we may do that in limited hardcover these are pretty interesting letters that he wrote to his aunts and we have uh, one letter i think to his mother and uh, because of the sentimental nature that'll probably be a big uh, big seller we think i mean they, he really lets his hair down talking about personal matters that he wouldn't share with his fellow writers or other amateurs uh we have letters to Berdovsky coming up this is far out now uh in the in the pipeline letters to cole and galpin i think the letter we we, we did the letters to alfred galpin some time ago but they're going to be reworked and uh, bundled with letters to cole and i think as far as we actually have another series coming which is the letters of clark ashton smith annotated and uh so smith barlow smith wandry smith durless uh, Smith and Smith and Loveman. These will be really fascinating, and so that'll be a parallel letter series to go along with our collected letters of Lovecraft, all annotated by S. T. Joshi and David E. Schultz, who were the two big wigs of Lovecraft studies. I would say. All right. Uh, I want to mention that Dark Adventure Radio Theater, uh, the H. P. Lovecraft Historical Society guys. They've got, uh, they're doing Haunter of the Dark, uh, you know, their audio dramas that they do, uh, which I love them. I think they do a fantastic job, and you guys know how I feel about audio dramas and old-time radio. Uh, Sean told me that Haunter of the Dark should be out sometime in late June, give or take. So I'm looking forward to that. That's one of my favorite Lovecraft stories. Do you know, Mike, um, are they going to hmm? put any of the – the shadow from the steeple or any of that is any of that included in there is like it all been put in together as one big story or uh, i don't know i'm sorry just that i thought that that would have made a really nice package if they did all three stories yeah no i don't know um along those same lines the love uh, the lovecraft easing fiction podcast that's for patreon members the first one is almost done and I'm titling it, uh, the whole series is titled Lovecraftian Tales, uh, Stories of Weird Fiction and Cosmic Horror. So uh, I would say sometime this coming week, that'll be released to my Patreon members. So if you're interested in that, it's only five bucks a month. Um, and you're supporting, and I'm poor, so it helps. Um, just Google, well, I've got the link. If you're watching or listening, the link will be in the in the description, but you can also Google Lovecraft easing Patreon. And I believe it's the first link that comes up. Um, and I think before uh, John, I know John's got a couple of recommendations before we go, but I think I forgot that we wanted to mention behold the void. Didn't we Philip? You want to say something real quick about behold the void? I'm muted. Oh I, yeah, sure. Of course. Uh, behold the void. Uh, it just came out on audio. So, um, just actually the day before yesterday, uh, Journal okay. Stone released the audio version of that, so it's now available through Audible. Um, that's, that's for those who don't know, that's Philip's collection, Philip Fricasi. Yeah, collection Behold the Void as in nine stories, and the uh, one of the stories from the book is called Alter, which is one of the first uh, stories I released prior to the collection. It's in the collection, but you can, uh, through... Monday, tomorrow, May 1st, you can download it for free, uh, the Kindle version via Amazon.com. So you can download Al Alter for free, and if you like that, you can pick up the rest of the books. Got eight more stories, and also the Audible version uh, just came out, so that's also available. And I've right listened to this sample. Listening. Right now, Pretty everyone good. listening on like May the 5th or something, they're going, damn it. <laughs> yeah, right. If you're listening and it's not, it's May 2nd, you got to pay for it. You're screwed. <laughs> yeah. but you don't have to pay very much, I'll say that. But just get the collection and you'll have Alter in it. You'll get the collection is, collection. yeah, the collection is got Alter in it. Yeah, I think uh, you're better uh, off yeah. going that route, wouldn't you say, Philip? Yes. Just go, definitely go, go for the collection. Yeah. Uh, all right. And last but not least, John's got a couple of recommendations. I think you said John. Yeah, actually, Alter was one of those recommendations. Oh, uh, by okay. Um, it, there, there, there were a couple of stories uh, over the last year that, that blew the top of my head off. And Alter is definitely one of them. <laughs> uh, amazing. Um, Thank you. Um, S.P. Miskowski's uh, uh, Muscadines is the other one. <laughs> uh, wow. 
Oh, it, thank you very much. It, it, it uh, um, ever since I, I, I read that story, um, it, it keeps popping back up in my mind, um, uh, uh, which is always a great sign. Um, and uh, uh, lastly, um, I've, I've, I've got to, to recommend a book that I, I know a lot of people have recommended, um, but uh, the author is, is not as well known as he should be, uh, Christopher Slatsky, um, Electromancer and other uh, weird tales. Um, it, it's um, one of the, the best uh, weird fiction collections uh, that I can remember. It's amazing. He yeah. also has a new one act play just like you in the end of your book now too. It's yep. a new trend among weird fiction authors. <laughs> I like the one act play. I read Slatsky's and That's his collection great. is amazing. But that one act play he wrote is it's the real deal. It is creepy. Slatsky's yeah. creepy. mighty good. Mighty yeah, good. He's great. Yeah. And I, I just want to, I just want to say, I would be a, I would be a rotten author if I didn't uh, mention Muscadines is also published by Dunham's Manor Press, and so you know, thanks very much to Jordan Crawl for, um, for taking up that story and uh, taking it to heart, and he did a beautiful job, matched me up with a wonderful, uh, a wonderful artist, Dave Felton, and it's, it's a nice little book. Yeah, the illustrations in there. Are really I want to give cool. credit to Dunham's Manor Press and to to Jordan Crawl. So. And also did Alter, my first, second chapter. Did the secret of ventriloquism. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. I keep yes. on saying that <laughs> Dunham's Manor is like the 4AD of weird fiction presses right now, which I think I'm dating my age by saying it's the 4AD of small presses, but it pretty much is. Once you see that, you go, okay, I'll pick it up sight unseen. He just nails it every time. It's true. Straight. Well, today is April the 30th. If you're listening to this anytime in this coming week, it's Sunday, April the 30th, uh, you can get in on the prize for the week. Uh, just email lovecrafteasingprizes at gmail.com. And the prize is another ticket to Necronomicon. So if you'd like a free ticket to Necronomicon, that's a great value. I don't remember what they are. I think they're 75 bucks or something like that. I don't know. Um, Email lovecrafteasyingprizes at gmail.com. And in the subject, please put, um, just put Necronomicon. That's fine. Or Necronomicon ticket, whatever you want to put. Uh, and I will use random.org to choose somebody a week from now uh, to choose the winner. So, John, once again, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, man, so much. It's great talking thank, with you. Thank all of, thanks to all of you. Um, it's It's been uh, amazing. <laughs> uh, Matt nice Bartlett talking is with you, John. Really, you too. <laughs> Matt Bartlett, I think, is just disappointed because I he wrote on the message board that he expected the dummy to toss you out and just do the whole interview. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it. I was going to say good night, <laughs> Reggie. You know, so he didn't feel let out. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. Oh, you're going to get Reggie. There he is. Pete's so creeped out right now. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, other Glenn. Nice seeing you. Good night, Good night Reggie. Reggie. Next week, I'm bringing my sock puppets. <laughs> um, everybody, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Um, and we will see you next week.